Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Elizabeth Bro, and I lead the Modern Deterrence Project here at RUSI. And I'm incredibly thrilled and proud to be hosting today's uh, Corona lesson featuring Finland, which is, of course, a country we all loved anyway. But we love it even more now that they, uh, the Finns have outperformed uh, almost every other single country. In, in uh, dealing with the coronavirus crisis, not just from a public health perspective, but um, also in terms of uh, resilience and preparedness. And they have done so, uh, we, will, we will hear how they managed to do that from our two speakers, but I think it's safe to say uh, that one of the secrets to their success is that, is that they were prepared before the event, long before the event. And uh, they have, of course, the Finns have, of course, of course long specialized in preparedness and total defense. Uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, Finland, in response to this crisis, invoked the em Emergency National Powers Act for the first time ever, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that from, from our two speakers. And uh, with that, I will uh, introduce the two speakers. Maria Ohisalo is Finland's interior minister. She's also the leader of the Green Party in Finland, which is, as you know, one of five parties forming the coalition government. And uh, the, this government in particular has, I think, uh, turned out to be the world's favorite government simply because of, of the way it's set up. And we are incredibly proud that Maria is speaking here at Brusik for the first time. And it's also worth noting, so Maria became an MP last year, so it's a very uh, quick career um, already. So we'll be watching you, uh, Minister, to see <laughs> where, where your career heads next. But it's also worth noting that Minister Ohisalo's uh, PhD thesis dealt with, if I may translate into layman's terms, how people who receive uh, public food assistance, essentially soup kitchens, how they uh, feel about it. And, and uh, I think that's highly relevant now that the economy in virtually every single country is set for a steep uh, decline. I'm also incredibly thrilled that Kimo Kovaka is here. He is um, a long-term, official, essentially the official leading Finland's uh, emergency preparedness planning and response to crises uh, ranging from this one, but including other ones as well. And it's, it's worth noting that Kimo is a former Finnish Defence Forces officer specialising in CBRN, so mass and weapons of mass destruction. So I, it's, um, I think, safe to say, that if, if any contingency uh, in, in that area were to befall Finland, uh, they would be in good, the Finns would be in good hands as well. With that, I'll hand over the floor to Minister Ohisalo. She'll speak first, then uh, Kimo Kovaka will speak, and then we'll have uh, the usual question and answer session. And feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box while the speakers are speaking, if you're so inclined, if you, if you, if you can't wait to post your question, I will uh, then, um, and of course, keep a look, close look at those questions coming in. So with that, over to you, Minister. Thank you very much. And uh, dear participants, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to be here today. Um, Finland has been using a so-called comprehensive security model in its civil preparedness for decades already. Uh, the model rests on the assumption that we should be prepared for all kinds of crises, from everyday accidents all the way to military conflict or war. However, the ongoing coronavirus crisis was the first time after the Second World War that Finland has taken our emergency powers into use. I would like to highlight uh, three lessons from the coronavirus pandemic, which is still un unfortunately ongoing. First of all, uh, the need for strong emergency actions at a very early stage. Let's start by outlining uh, where we were in Finland on the 16th of March 2020. On that day, the Finnish government uh, declared a state of emergency in the country and introduced a 19-point list of very strong measures to address the coronavirus situation. At this time, the outbreak was still 
at an early stage and uh, no people had died from the virus yet. In the government, uh, we felt that these strong first measures were necessary to control the coronavirus from spreading uncontrollably. Uh, strong measures ahead of time gave us more time to prepare. Primary schools were closed down and public gatherings were limited uh, to 10 persons. Later on, the government decided on a regional lockdown of closing the borders of our greater capital area or region, Uusima, for nearly three weeks. This is an example of uh, an unforeseen and unprecedented measure and not taken even during the war times. Our government had to make these tough decisions with very limited information, as we've all been in this situation. Uh, our preparedness structures were tested right away. Our society proved pretty resilient and flexible and able to react quickly to a very new situation. And this is, of course, thanks to the people in Finland who reshaped their everyday life, kept their children at home, and uh, many have obviously also suffered economically and socially. Especially children in families with economical difficulties have had it rough uh, when schools were closed and, for example, social preventive services and hobbies were downsized to, to minimum. And our, obviously our uh, next big step in the government is to prevent further social impacts of the corona crisis. And this brings me to my second point, um, that is the importance of respecting human rights and fundamental rights and balancing with negative social impacts of restrictions. From the beginning, uh, protection of health and human life uh, was the guiding principle of all the actions at governmental level. At the same time, all decisions had to be made respecting basic human rights, fundamental rights and the rule of law. This is um, a balancing act requiring lots of preparation, but an absolutely crucial one. This is an essential lesson we have to keep in mind for future crises. Also, our actions should not cause more harm than they help us. As a short-term solution, we can restrict our society and our lives significantly, but in the longer run, the social impact of those uh, restricting actions have to be taken into account. For example, we can we can not expect people in risk groups to avoid all human contact for years in hope of a vaccination, for example. This means we have to use our time to the best we can to rebuild our society in a corona resilient way so that we can lift restrictions and keep corona cases down at the same time. And the third lesson a controlled and coordinated communications is essential. I would like to finish by emphasizing the value of clear communication as the cornerstone of effective uh, decision making. In a crisis like the coronavirus pandemic, it is of utmost importance that the highest governmental political level is active and clear in its message. In my view, effective communications should be seen as a core operative capability for crisis management, not just the medium for providing information. And actually an example of this, the Finnish police described communications as a new capability of action after successful campaigns on social distancing or physical distancing on 1st of May celebrations and, and school endings. And I can say that the 1st of May celebrations here in Finland are a huge party all over the, the country. And we were really afraid here, especially at the Ministry of Interior and the police forces to see 
how people will react on that day. Will they go out for picnics? Will they meet each other? But actually, we have a lot of footage on, on the country showing empty parks and, and, and showing no picnics at all. And this was really uh, mainly done because of a good communication strategy. And in conclusion, we should not prepare for past emergencies, but learn from them to prepare for the ones to come. Uh, there is a silver lining to every crisis, even this pandemic. Uh, we have gained invaluable experience, not just for preparing for pandemics, but for all kinds of crises, and will be stronger when the next one arrives. We can already see that, uh, for example, climate change will be a challenge, far more devastating and a lot more far-reaching if we don't take preventive and preparatory action already now. Reconstruction after Corona is an ex excellent opportunity for ecological paradigm shift if, if we choose it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, an, ecolo an ecological paradigm shift, that's something that uh, I think we will accept, uh, we will need to accept uh, soon that, that we need, uh, or otherwise we will uh, have those extreme weather events that will be as, uh, have uh, effects as severe as this crisis, um, albeit in, in different ways. With that, I'll turn the floor over to um, Kim Kovaka, and um, I already see people are writing questions, so feel free to, to keep writing questions, and uh, obviously you can write more questions to as uh, this, uh, the Q&A gets going. So over to you, Kimmo. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you, uh, Rosie, uh, for this much appreciated possibility to present some of Finnish views at this webinar. Rosie has done some remarkable job with the facilitating these webinars uh, in order to share views and uh, experiences. As the minister already highlighted, uh, Finland has been applying comprehensive security model in its civil preparedness. All hazards, all of society model has worked on as a basis on situation management and the gathering of information when it comes to lessons learned is uh, very much on its way at the moment. I would like to, let's say, approach this um, uh, overall lessons learned with, from uh, four uh, points of view. Firstly, uh, it is more or less safe to say that in a constantly evolving society, in a constantly evolving threat scenarios, one is never ready. Even with the strong legislation, even when pre-planned actions, even with strong national exercise tradition, we will continue to see new threats with uh, unexpected uh, twists. So uh, flexibility and general procedures in a whole of society approach is a key quality. What we do in emergency circumstances, we must be able to do also in normal times and vice versa. Uh, what we can do is mitigate the consequences of black swans and other crises. Identified risks should be reflected in actual investments in preparedness instead of focusing merely on the past. So as uh, Minister already stated, we should work on preparing for future ones and in a comprehensive and systemic way. Uh, in Finland's case, we have just recently at the beginning of last year updated the national risk assessment as a basis of preparedness work pandemic threat has been present in our threat scenarios. Secondly, uh, I might point out in the end, the ability to make decision is the most important thing in managing the situation. Uh, that comes with good situational awareness, ability to utilize information in an effective and timely manner is uh, a key uh, requirement. In our case, Finland is a relatively small country when it comes to size of the public sector and other societal actors as a whole. This together with a tradition 
uh, strong tradition and structures of cooperation has been helping when adapting to the situation. In this crisis, we have excellent examples how the traditional decision-making process has been challenged, how to manage the chain of information from scientific advisors to expert officials to top officials, and then finally to political decision-making. In many cases, the time span alone projects a huge challenge. In these circumstances, uh, once again, our tradition and practice of cooperation has helped tremendously. And whatever gaps we have been finding, the valuable experience gained can be used also in wider development of the national preparedness system. Thirdly, uh, I would like to state that the, the preparedness business, uh, the very difficult uh, thing is to how to do it wide, all of society uh, and deep when it comes to detailing, uh, detailed questions enough. During the 30 years of uh, personal experience in civil preparedness, uh, the difficulty in, in our line of business is to be able to foresee the sufficient level of readiness pre-planning and arrangements needed. Uh, additional need to exercise, uh, as of one example, <clears throat> with what we have uh, uh, finding, exercising, uh, how to do it cross-sectorally, -sector horizontally and vertically in a society, uh, how to do it in a whole of society mode is perhaps the key finding when developing further our exercising system for the future uh, requirements. How to do this in an effective manner is the challenge. Uh, one another uh, example, example of a challenge, uh, challenges in, um, in preparedness, uh, just a question to everybody who has been, let's say, making decisions in uh, what it comes to resourcing the preparedness, uh, what if uh, one year ago someone would have said that we will need we will be needing 1.5 billion uh, euros for um, uh, medical preparedness readiness uh, building stockpiling equipment and so forth and same in Finnish uh, scale if one should have been uh, proposing that 150 million euros needed to uh, protect your equipment in medical cases that could have been rather challenging in today's society. Uh, when handling still this current situation, we have to remember all the time the other significant risks and threats we are facing. Adaptation, for instance, the climate change and for example, ex extreme weather conditions has to be also very much high uh, priority in uh, civil preparedness also in the future. Of course, lessons learned when it comes to managing and uh, handling of the situation, this is uh, very valuable at, the, at this moment. Uh, fourthly, I would say that uh, <clears throat> mental resilience of uh, the population and the people uh, is, is, is something of a key quality. Uh, maintaining trust in, author or in authorities and political system is one uh, key feature. Uh, in Finnish case, uh, I would say that the Finnish population has responded very calmly to the crisis. We have evidence that the necessary actions and the guidance has been received with general acceptance. The good result and success in limiting the virus spreading is most certainly uh, very much because of this compliance of, uh, of the guidance. And still, uh, in, on the challenge side, creating necessary guidance and preparing to support uh, the public and actors to apply the guidance has been the general challenge in all affected sectors. Is the guidance given by the authority obligatory or just a recommendation? When uh, authority gives a recommendation is very much always interpreted as mandatory one. This has already caused uh, lots of discussion uh, in various fields in, in our society. From these points of view, I would like to conclude by, uh, let's say, had a repetition of what, what have we definitely already gained. 
we have been gaining experience for leadership and top decision makers in managing the national and international exceptional circumstances and crises. Furthermore, in, in depth in that experience, uh, how the situational awareness demands should be built, uh, what demands there are for the decision making in a governmental national level. Uh, the idea of the general working together cooperation has enhanced in necessary, uh, the necessary swift legislative work is uh, some gained experience. And of course, uh, once again, already stated by our minister, the crisis communication and its uh, uh, great, great importance in the situation. We have, of course, we have gained national resolve. We have a spirit, a strong spirit of a national cooperation both in organiza organizations and citizens, that is considered also a very, very strength uh, when it comes to facing tomorrow's challenges. And to, uh, to the end, uh, just put it all together, working together rather than just cooperating is a goal in itself. Coronavirus situation seems to underline that working together regularly with threat assessment, working together with pre-planning, working together with preparing and exercising nationally and internationally seems to be the best way to assure working effectively together in a situation management and in adaptation to the challenges the future holds. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a, a long list of questions myself, but I, I won't be able to ask them because there are so many other questions coming in. So I limit myself to one, which is, um, Minister, you mentioned the, the importance of, of uh, communication and that, 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 that is a tool in itself, not just a way in which to communicate, uh, in which to transmit information. And, and um, Kimo, you mentioned uh, the mental resilience of the population. So if both of you, maybe starting with you, Minister, if you could address, please, how, how you get the people to do what you want them to do, rather than uh, the government just saying something and then people just ignoring it, uh, which sim clearly wasn't the case in Finland, uh, judging from, from the lack of people out uh, picnicking on the, on the 1st of May. So how, how do you get them to do what you want them to do? Thank you. Um, well, for example, uh, the prime minister started from the first week already and the government together started an information session so that the public broadcasting company send a, a video from the government information event nearly every day during a couple of the first weeks and uh, all the way until yesterday, maybe even today, the government has been having these information um, events that has been broadcasted very um, nat nationwide. And um, uh, also the messages we've tried to say have been quite, um, how to say, short and understandable. Let's say hashtag stay home. That was that was something that was used all over the world. And so here in Finland, the authorities could be, let's say if it was the police forces, the border guard, uh, uh, healthcare authorities, they were holding papers saying, stay at home, do it for the public cause and for the public good. And, and I think the role of social media was really important here. And I also want to thank the social media platforms that they also took the virus into their um, information that you could uh, you can still read about the virus in, in Instagram and Facebook and so on. And, and uh, I've personally told all the time that no authority can stop a virus like this. We can only stop it if every each individual takes care of their share. And obviously we know that uh, different groups in the society are differently prepared for these kinds of crises and, and especially the marginalized groups can can handle probably these kinds of crises not as well as as many other people so we've also tried to thank every and each person who has 
been taking the responsibility here because even that that you only stayed at home you made your part and we wanted to thank about this the whole the whole nation thank you uh, kimo did you want to come in Well, it's uh, very natural to say that I'm all the same opinion than our minister uh, in, in, in this. Uh, perhaps uh, there's a long, long tradition in, in that uh, area also that uh, I think that uh, uh, that has been very important, that, that the good communications and the, the, the ideas of how the top level of government decision making, what, what are the basis and the grounds and so forth. The information flow has been very, very, very good. I think that's uh, one of the reasons. And of course, uh, uh, we've been measuring, there's no actual answer, why is that so, but we've been measuring the the, the Finnish population's trust for authorities' uh, act, actions and so forth uh, during the years, and it, it, they are rather high. Uh, for instance, there was um, uh, there was a, a questionnaire concerning the public organization's trust uh, or brand. Uh, what what does our population, uh, let's say, think about any public public organizations uh, out of the 10 best, best of those, uh, six out of them were safety and security officials. And uh, that perhaps gives some sort of, a, so, sort of a, let's say, uh, idea that uh, there, there is some sort of a inbuilt trust also that, uh, that we are enjoying in, 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 in authorities from, from our population. Of course, that has to be earned every day and especially the the very difficult political decision making that uh, now country has gone gone through uh, well it has to be the, i mentioned that uh, how to uh, create from the uh, very uh, perhaps insecure uh, scientific information to a expert advice and put it into top officials recommendations and finally to to uh, the political decision maker, that has to be very transparent at this moment. Uh, there's no possibility to, let's say, uh, uh, that uh, say that okay, it just goes like this. It has to be transparent. People have to understand why we are doing what we are doing, and uh, that I think, in in very much in our uh, respect in in Finland, has been a success so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... I will direct this question to Minister Ohisalo. Uh, thank you for organizing this very important discussion. Kimo mentioned the decisions facing political and public service leaders. Finland has a new government with lots of young leaders. Uh, did the Finnish services have the opportunity to exercise decision making in a crisis with political leaders since the new government was formed? And is that a regular feature of Finnish emergency preparedness? So, uh, Minister. Uh, for you or Kim, if you'd like to answer. Maybe I could start and Kim could continue from here. Um, yes, this government started a year ago and actually half a year ago. Uh, well, I, I correct myself. This government actually started a half a year ago and a year ago we started with the same group. But we changed the prime minister in between. So the year has been quite turbulent in many ways. Uh, from my point of view and from Kimmos, uh, obviously the Ministry of Interior is the Ministry of uh, Preparedness and, and we've had um, exercises where pandemic situations have also been considered together with other risks. And, uh, uh, but I must say that as a government totally, the whole government together, we haven't really had time to, to prepare these kinds of uh, prepare ourselves for these kinds of crises together but each ministry has obviously had their plans um, for different kinds of crises but I also have to add that um, the plans we had regarding pandemic situations uh, they were uh, the numbers of for example clothing you need during these kinds of crises for the healthcare authorities and, and uh, personnel there, the numbers were really low. Nobody ever 
expected expected the use of these uh, um, tools so much that we are using millions of uh, masks uh, every week and so on and I think this is also something that the whole world is facing and that is why obviously the whole market has been in, in a turbulent situation too so I don't think anybody in the world was prepared for this kind of a crisis enough thank you very much and uh, I'd like to uh, direct the next question to Kimo and maybe Kimo if you could also um, tell the, the listeners or viewers a little bit about uh, Finland's stockpiles, uh, because that's an important feature that uh, where Finland has outperformed other countries, you did have significant stockpiles uh, in a way that other countries did not. So here is uh, the question, did the enactment of emergency powers for the first time uh, go smoothly? And uh, so connected to that question, what are the challenges in moving beyond cross-ministry cooperation towards something more joined up? Okay, uh, uh, there's some, uh, if I if I listen to you correctly, uh, three ones, uh, all, all very interesting, a very, very good question. Thank you very much. But um, starting with the with the stockpiling, um, Finland has uh, one key feature that is, uh, that's been uh, a, a very, very strong uh, feature in our, our preparedness. That is our national emergency supply system. Uh, it's, a, it's a traditional, uh, it's, it's been on use for since the uh, Second World War. And uh, the basic idea in this uh, national emergency supply system is that we have a, we have a uh, legislation backing up that we, we collect uh, funds from different sources in order to be able to, let's say, create uh, readiness uh, when it comes to fuels, when it comes to grains, when it comes to food, when it comes to uh, different uh, critical, uh, uh, let's say, uh, materials. And uh, that is uh, all based in our legislation and it's, it's available to everybody. You go just www.nesa.fi. You can find here the basic resolution, the legislation and how the our NESA uh, National Emergency Supply Agency works. And even our minister said uh, that that's even so, we have been very, very struggling with this medical uh, uh, equipment, uh, medical protective equipment uh, uh, in our case also. Uh, but if, if you think, and a lot of discussion has been surrounding by that, but uh, what, it, what, it, what really hasn't come so much, uh, let's say in the, <clears throat> in the surface is that because of that national emergency supply system, there is not uh, very much trouble in what it comes to everyday uh, products or, or uh, the groceries and things like we, we need. Or, and uh, even though uh, this crisis hasn't gone uh, that far, the, the basis and the back, back of it is that uh, we have a, a very, let's say, wide and good system where our public sector works intensively with the uh, uh, with the private sector, and they are voluntarily involved. Have been for decades in this preparing system. How to organize, uh, let's say, uh, emergency supplies for, as I said, fuels for grains, for food stuff, uh, for medicals, uh, communication systems. Uh, 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 and now, nowadays, even cyber uh, uh, systems. And uh, one one feature being that uh, even every household's needs for what it comes to foodstuffs has been organized in that pooling. We call it pooling system, and uh, therefore, uh, even the do domestic uh, readiness is is covered by this system. Um, secondly, uh, there was this. Uh, Use of emergency powers act, uh, as we already stated, that was that was um, uh, uh, first time after the uh, Second World War, and still I have to say that being prepared for 30 years to take in the emergency powers act uh, uh, into use, and during the decades of this preparation, this, uh, we've been exercising of how should we take this uh, very very uh, let's say. Uh, um, a grave situation and uh, where the emergency powers act uh, uh, are taken into use 
And uh, I'd say uh, that that even even though it's a difficult decision, it's a tough de de decision. It went uh, quite smoothly from where I'm standing and what, what I'm uh, understanding. The political decision makers quickly, uh, let's say, assess the situation. And in our case, the government, government together with our, uh, our president, uh, makes the evaluation. And after that, the government uh, takes the steps that we are noticing that the um, emergency situation is is on hand and then the emergency powers act can be taken into use and uh, uh, connected to that thirdly the question uh, about the uh, cooperation between authorities uh, i come back to come back to my uh, presentation I, I want to say that i've been even though we have this strong uh, uh, cooperation uh, tradition we have a, a special, uh, let's say, readiness preparedness system where there are state uh, uh, permanent secretaries in our ministries regularly meet. We have a um, uh, comprehensive security council where in addition to those uh, permanent secretaries, there are top officials uh, like uh, chief of police, chief of defense force, uh, staff uh, of defense forces, I myself, our, our uh, national security uh, police and uh, so forth. So uh, this preparation phase, when we regularly discuss these matters on the risk assessment and preparedness, gives tools when something like this happens. So, um, and in, in the Finnish case, we already know uh, very uh, uh, closely each other, so it's very easy to go that mode uh, when it comes to handling on the na nationwide situation. Sorry for being so many words, but I tried to explain uh, how uh, we are approaching this kind of system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two questions for Minister Ohisalo, starting with uh, one here. Um, have uh, you taken, have decision makers, so uh, such as yourself, primarily yourself, taken advice from scientists and other experts? This is an issue here in the UK. And a second question for you, Minister, um, regarding schools. Uh, how was, uh, has the return to schools been, uh, how has that been done? And did the teachers and parents support this? And that's a question from Mike Gapes, who is a former MP here in the UK. Thank you. Very good questions. Um, we have launched uh, quite a quite many uh, scientific uh, advice, advisory groups. Uh, first of all, into the exit plan from uh, coronavirus. There, we already gained two reports from an expert group, which was um, supported by um, a scientific panel. Uh, from different kinds of uh, sectors from this uh, society, from social politics to um, economics uh, to environmental questions. And uh, we've seen it as a really important uh, tool for us as a government. In the beginning, especially, we heard really well uh, the message that the healthcare authorities were saying and the first... Uh, steps we took were mainly based on obviously on the healthcare authorities messages but as politicians we don't only look at the healthcare sector and the virus but we need to as i mentioned in the beginning we need to look at the whole economical and social political situation of the society that the causes of the virus won't be uh, that uh, hard and and long and and uh, and also we've been aiming to open uh, quite a lot of information uh, every time we've made the decision we've tried to open uh, we especially uh, well some parties have been especially pushing forward for open data discussions and and the fact that uh, we should let the whole society why not even worldwide uh, people to assess the the modelings the the ways we were making the decisions. 
And uh, I noticed from the chat that somebody was asking about the data sharing, information sharing. And I think it's really important that if one country finds something crucially well working, we should definitely share it because this is a global pandemic. This is not a national issue, even though many countries were responding with a very national approaches. And I think uh, European Commission here has especially done a lot of work in, in coordinating the countries together. Um, then the other question was about the schools. We closed them down uh, and that, that was a huge digital jump for all of the teachers, the, the parents and, and many of the parents were working from home and at the same time having their children going to school via internet and, uh, and this was definitely a hard thing. And when we then decided that, okay, now the pandemic situation is at the level that we could actually open the schools, we had already new information about the whole, um, how the virus acts with the young children and so on. We decided that, okay, there is still two weeks left from this um, period that, okay, two weeks before the summer breaks, we saw that it's important to open the schools because there are a lot of these children that don't get the support from home the very good uh, uh, teachers we have in this country are sometimes the only uh, adults that can really lift up these children that have problems with uh, their schooling and, and learning and so on. There was quite a bit of a debate before we opened uh, the schools for these last two weeks. Some thought that, okay, what can you do during the two last weeks anymore? Well, then the government uh, answered that actually for these children, especially from maybe marginalized groups, it's really important to have like every day at school is really important. And we actually saw that there was no infections. Uh, there were a couple of schools that uh, the classes were taken back home because some cases were found, but most of the cases came outside the schools and we're not spreading inside the schools so now we can already assess this and then work better if the next wave comes at some point thank you there are a couple of questions here that i'd like to direct to kimo and they are both concerned they both concern the armed forces and, and to summarize, uh, the, they, uh, the two people ask what the role of the armed forces have been in, in this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as a former military officer, this is a very, very, uh, let's say, close to heart. Also, this, this uh, question. Um, in, in our case, uh, we have a strong legislation where the armed forces, the military, uh, has, let's say, by its legislation, we call them uh, secondary tasks. First is, of course, uh, defending the uh, country in, in a military uh, threat, but the second one is to participate each and every uh, uh, authority's actions if needed, giving support uh, for it in rescue services wise uh, military is uh, by its legislation and rescue service legislation it is uh, obligated to participate rescue services uh, let's say actions and uh, in this particular uh, crisis uh, military has ha had a, a significant role in supporting police when we had this um, Uusimaa, uh, southern uh, Finland region lockdown uh, with the uh, uh, guidance and with the, with the leadership of the police uh, responsible of this uh, follow up, this, uh, this lockdown uh, restrictions, uh, surveillance and so forth, the military provided extra hands and extra uh, manpower to do that under uh, strict uh, ruling and guidance of the police force and of course and uh, during this uh, situation also our military has been let's say using its um, uh, scientific um, uh, capabilities when it comes to CBRN uh, work also by studying uh, whether it could be possible to quickly des disinfect uh, uh, personal masks and so forth so uh, basically, the military has been 
of course, controlling when we have a conscript training at the moment ongoing, and we have garrisons with lots of lots of uh, young men and the women, women on those. The military has been, uh, let's say, uh, of of course, concentrating that the virus is not spreading on on those. Uh, uh, situations. So, um, uh, to come uh, say say in all, uh, uh, there's a possibility to use in every emergency uh, our military forces also support for civilian authorities, and uh, these couple ec examples I gave uh, are, are how we have so far been able to use also the military capabilities. Thank you. A question for you, Minister. Actually, two questions. Uh, one person asking uh, what you would have, what the government would have done differently, um, and the second uh, question in, in a similar vein. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the person asks, looking at how you have been able to manage the first wave of the virus regarding lockdown and suspension of some services such as education. Is there anything in particular you would change when considering how to respond to any potential second waves or third waves for that matter in the future? Okay, uh, what could we have done better or differently? There are a lot of things, obviously. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from this and uh, we are already in our way to uh, renew the legislation we've been using here, the normal time legislation and also the crisis time legislation. We're going through both of them in order to them function better uh, in the future if we happen to come into these uh, situations again. And uh, one thing, even though we are known for being good at these uh, stockpiles uh, questions and and we we are um, we had quite a lot of uh, these materials but still as the world market turned totally uh, upside down and we noticed that we still didn't have enough of uh, all the materials we would have needed so now we've started our own production here in Finland and uh, hopefully we can also support other countries in the beginning uh, in the in the in the future uh, this is something that we definitely learned and then one example is also that um, an airport is a field that is controlled by maybe seven or eight different ministries they all have some sort of a role at an airport the biggest airport here in Finland and then suddenly we noticed that, okay, many people from abroad, mainly Finns, were coming back home from Italy, from Spain, from the areas where the virus had already been spreading more. So how to act with these people, how to get them home safely and without infecting other people at the airport, at the public transportation and so on. This was definitely something where we learned to coordinate uh, because we tend to work in silos. This definitely, I, I bet this is a problem everywhere. And that one particular airport uh, showed up to be uh, a problem because there were too many people responsible and, and not only one uh, organization responsible for that. Uh, and can you reframe the, the, the other question again? Can you say that again? It was about uh, how you will use the lessons learned from this wave to to uh, do better, even better, uh, when this, uh, when a uh, second or third wave hits. Uh, well, coming back to the previous question on uh, on schools and education, I think we will definitely look more closely on that. That we would not have to close the schools as much as we did. Um, that the children would still have the support every day. Uh, more than they probably now had and um, there are ways to build this let's say one and a half or two meter societies we've already seen examples how how all of the magazine stores are using um, uh, stickers everywhere and we need to have uh, hand sanitizers and all these kinds of things everywhere in order to to build the society more uh, more ready 
uh, for new kinds of uh, risks like these. And as I mentioned, we are now going through the legislation so that we would have all the needed tools if we ever come back to this kind of a situation. And I think this, because as I mentioned, it is a global challenge and uh, we need to change it exchange information all the time, especially, uh, or a couple of hours ago, I just had a meeting with the ministers of interior from the Nordic countries, and we are already sharing information. We are sharing um, ideas on how the COVID virus has affected, for example, the internal security in the Nordic countries, and we can already see some uh, similarities here. So we try to then also uh, and not only in the Nordic level, also in the EU level, we try to coordinate in order to become better together. Thank you. Lots of questions and not many minutes left, but I, I'll give uh, two here to you, um, Kimmo. And uh, the first one actually touches on what, what Minister Ohisala just said um, about Nordic cooperation, uh, but it's more practical. So, so I think it's, it's a question for you. Um, uh, fin but this is a question from Mike Gapes, former MP. Uh, Finland has a long border with Sweden. How were the different approaches managed in places like joint shop, the joint shopping area in uh, Tornio slash Haparanda and in border communities? And the second question for you, uh, Kimo, is, has there been or was there much panic buying? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, in, in generally the Nordic cooperation in, in also in our respective levels, you have to remember that uh, my field of expertise covers the rescue services and civil preparedness. Then in the Ministry of Interior, we have border guards, of course, and uh, this border system, uh, the border restrictions have been issued on, on that, uh, let's say, particular field. And our minister is, of, of course, uh, been in, in a very, very on top of those questions also. For my side, I say that the Nordic cooperation also in our field has been very constant. We've been meeting with the Directors General of Civil Preparedness for weekly basis and sharing information when it comes to uh, what is happening uh, each and every country and assuring, for instance, in the in the Sweden, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, Norway borders that the rescue services and the emergency medical services can still function uh, without uh, hindrance, uh, even though there's uh, restrictions on the area. Just as generally uh, saying that, uh, that the issue in the northern part in the Lapland uh, with the border crossing is very, very uh, it, uh, well important one. And our government has just recently made decision concerning that, that area uh, also. Uh, once again, uh, I would like to remind of the second question. What was the uh, second one? It was a question from Lord Arbathnot, and that was, has there been much panic buying? Uh, just uh, panic on anything or some in particular yeah, people buying large quantities of, of whatever they think yeah, is yeah. <coughs> okay and here uh, in the uk okay. uh, shops were empty the supermarkets were empty for some time because people well, were uh, uh, we started with that, that kind of a little little uh, same kind of effect as everywhere just a few days there was a scarce of some items in at the very beginning of this uh, situation but uh very very quickly uh when when it, it it became evident and that was something that we perhaps we explained it to the public that uh, that it, it it will be very very uh, uh let's say uh unlikely that finnish grocery stores would end uh, the goods on on the on the shelves and uh, after initial few, uh, let's say, um, uh, days, uh, the, the communications, uh, the, giving the uh, information to public, the situation normalized. And nowadays, uh, the things, I think it's, it's uh, quite well. I have to say that that's uh, some sort of a heroic, heroic epic uh, and the story is how our grocery stores, and I, I trust that it's a, a wider phenomena also in Finland, 
uh, even though the uh, shops are have been working regularly and normally uh, with the restriction with the uh, guidance on how to do it safely uh, it has been we have been able to shop and uh, buy food and uh, things because of the uh, enterprises and the shops uh, keepers are, are been working very very wisely and very good and uh, that has been a very good thing no panic in in that place Thank you. Yes, there are many supermarket workers we should be thanking when this crisis is over. Minister, I have quite a few questions for you here regarding international um, relationships, specifically if um, the, what, the, the way Finland has managed this crisis is, is a model that other countries can learn from, and, and if so, um, whether the government uh, is already speaking with other with other governments to to share some of your your uh, findings or best practices um, and also uh, specifically since we are here in the UK um, a question related to the UK uh, is the unusually high level of civic engagement and responsibility in Finland purely a cultural thing or other things that the UK should consider doing if it wants to replicate uh, the Finnish approach Um, thank you. I think there is a cartoon named Very Finnish Problems or something like this, which actually shows it quite well that uh, getting isolated is something that the, we as Finns are quite uh, good to do. We are used to going to our summer cabins, stay there for weeks, not seeing other people and, and suddenly there's, there's a crisis where you just don't need to meet anybody. I think we were quite good on this. So to not to joke too much with a critical issue, but still, um, this was something that uh, especially people who were able to work from home definitely did it. And the majority of these people who did it also would like to continue like that. So there was actually a shift, uh, as I mentioned, like a digital jump we did over a couple of weeks and we've been talking about it for years that we should do it in order to change our working life and so on. So now people were able to do this. Um, uh, we've been sharing the information about our decisions on, on, on English, uh, Swedish, Finnish with other languages too. And I think this is definitely something that we need to, and, and I personally have said here at the ministry already in the first days we started to discuss about this that now there needs to be somebody who writes down the history that we need to go through everything we did the good things the bad things and we need to learn from them and we definitely need to speak with other countries about these but uh, I just shortly go back to the question of open data and so on uh, I think we should worldwide share more data on this uh, pandemic and, and others like this because it won't help one country. If one country solves the problem, we should definitely all solve the problem together. And uh, I think this is also a question we as Finns should be better to open up the data for everybody so that the scientific uh, communities could also have the debates on on who did and what and, and where did that lead us? Thank you very much. There are a, a, a large number of excellent questions left, but I'll, I'll pick this one uh, simply because it's one that where I think everybody, uh, it's an area where everybody knows uh, the Finnish model, which is national service. So the question for both of you, maybe with just a very brief answer, do you think uh, national service has helped the population prepare, adapt and work together? So maybe if we start with you, Kimo, and, and then Minister uh, to, for the final word. Well, uh, the national uh, service the conscription, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a basic uh, knowledge information given in, in, in that service to what it comes to preparedness system. Well, that and of course we have a very comprehensive, uh, uh, comprehensive security training system on, on a top level, governmental level and regional level for officials and so forth. Uh, together these and uh, good information packages, I think that, that that's the trick. Thank you. Minister, did you want to come in? 
Well, just quickly, I think uh, the, that is a place, obviously, where the preparedness is all the time practiced and, and we definitely should uh, also think how to improve, how to develop uh, the whole idea of national service in, in order to, to also respond to new kinds of threats. And uh, as I mentioned in my speech, the, the climate change, uh, we already see it here at the Ministry of Interior. It, it should be seen in, in all the, the sectors and, and we should definitely take into account these new kinds of risks everywhere throughout the society. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for. I'm, I'm, I feel bad leaving so many excellent questions in, in the Q&A function, but that just means that when there is another crisis, we'll call on you again, uh, Minister Ohisalo and Kimo Kovac, Director, uh, of, Director General of uh, Finland's Rescue Services, to come and tell us more about how you do it in Finland. And until then, we'll, we'll all be watching how you manage the end of this outbreak. So thank you very much. Uh, Minister and Kimbo for joining us today and thank you all for listening and for your excellent questions. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.